On November 23, 2022, Gucci announced that Alessandro Michele is leaving his role as creative director, and as we wait to see what will happen next, let's take a look back at the previous eras of the brand and the mechanisms that helped define them. In 1921, Guccio Gucci opened his first boutique in Florence, selling leather goods with saddles and other equestrian accessories. Although the equestrian motif remained part of the brand's DNA, the focus quickly shifted to handbags and scarves, like the Flora scarf designed for Grace Kelly. Gucci stayed in the family until the 1980s, despite years of infighting, poor management, and market oversaturation. In 1990, Don Mello, the then president of Bergdorf Goodman, was brought in to revitalize Gucci, which had by this point developed a reputation for selling cheap, duty-free bags. She brought Richard Lambertson, head of Bergdorf's accessories department, to be the design director, Neil Barrett as senior menswear designer, and Tom Ford to oversee the woman's ready-to-wear. Gucci's advertising in this period was very Bergdorf's, a stylish, mature woman on holiday or attending to her busy social schedule. The emphasis was still very clearly set on the accessories, with the clothes making more of a statement with each year. When Tom Ford became creative director of Gucci in 1994, the brand was in a dire financial situation, to a point where they could not even afford to pay their staff. The house of Gucci was in turmoil, but you stuck it out. You stuck it out while a lot of people didn't, and ultimately well, everyone created was fired, a great except place. For me. Oh, you oh, were so, the only one not fired. Yeah, they were all fired, 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 <laughs> fired. I was still there. Fired, fired, fired. Um, so you I just kept your head down. Uh, well, no, I kept my head up uh, and tried to take charge, which is my character and personality. Um, but I worked for Maurizio Gucci for a period of time. Until 1992, I became design director, and then when Don Mello left in '94, I became creative director. Tom Ford's first collections were still what Maurizio Gucci wanted and without a unique vision. But on the verge of quitting and with nothing else to lose, the fall-winter 1995 collection sent shockwaves through the industry. He woke up the sleepy brand by injecting a hedonistic, super glam aesthetic that drew inspirations from the 1970s but in a modern interpretation. This was the porno chic era of Gucci. This was the first collection that I had complete creative control over. I had been at Gucci already at that time for about four years. It had been in my contract that I was not allowed to step out onto the runway. Maurizio Gucci really felt that he wanted the brand to be the important thing and not the fashion designer. So I had this moment where I was there and I could design whatever I wanted because no one was looking over my shoulder. And I was very proud of what I did, and I stepped out on the runway. His runway shows were electric, often with a surprise for the fashion editors and journalists in attendance, and celebrities were flocking to this new direction. From Madonna at the MTV VMAs, Elizabeth Hurley at the premiere of The American President, or Gwyneth Paltrow in the iconic red suit, Gucci was the hottest brand of the moment. It must be really hard for you, Victoria. You know, trying to decide whether to wear the little Gucci dress, the little Gucci dress, or oh, the little Gucci dress. Exactly. I know. Why don't you wear the little Gucci dress? That's a good idea. Thanks, then. With Karine Rothfeld styling, the campaigns shot by Mario Tassino defined this era of Gucci's advertising. Each season, the heat was turned up, and the campaigns became increasingly more edgy. It is normally in their editorial work where photographers can push their creativity, but with Karine and Tom, they embraced the sexy and dangerous. I always think you need to create an image where people stop and look at it. In those days, it was all about magazines and ad campaigns. And when your ad campaign came out, everyone really looked at it and took it apart. Today, I think really because of social media and the fact that everyone has a voice and everyone can be a critic, we've come to a point where it's often hard to be creative. It was so much easier in the 90s to be provocative in advertising. The pinnacle of this era and undoubtedly the most famous campaign in Gucci's history is the spring-summer 2003 campaign. You shaved a, 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 a G in a model's pubic hair. I know, and I actually did shave that G in that girl's pubic hair myself. 
Because why? Because we like to do things, we like to be in control, right? I wanted it exactly that way. I had to fill it in with an eyebrow pencil a little bit uh, so that we could read it on but camera. But I mean, that was maximum, you like, you in know, your face. It was. But, you know, I think it was the right thing at the right time. And it was meant to be taken with a bit of humor. It was a commentary on where we were with branding. We had pushed branding to the absolute limit. Everything was branded. So, why not brand? You know, a guy branding his girlfriend's pubic hair. Ford had taken the company from the brink of bankruptcy to a value of $4.3 billion, but the shift brought about by a change in ownership was the catalyst for his departure. You know, I left because I was not going to be able to have the kind of creative uh, license that I had had for so many years and that really helped build the company, and I was at a point where I had been used to that. After only two collections with Alessandra Facinetti, Frida Giannini became the creative director of Women's Wear and in 2006 of the entire Gucci label. Rather than injecting a new spirit into the brand, her years at Gucci seemed more like a toned-down version of Tom Ford's vision. Her debut spring-summer collection, in particular, looked like a neutering of Tom Ford's Gucci woman in favor of rugby polos and followed by billowy floral dresses. Giannini brought back the flora print from Princess Grace Kelly's scarves and referenced many other elements from Gucci's history, but the spark that Tom Ford had was visibly lacking. Commercially, however, Gucci continued to grow, especially with the accessories, which should not come as a surprise given that Giannini came to Gucci after working on a super successful baguette handbag while at Fendi. Gucci launched their US e-commerce website in 2002, one of the first luxury brands to do so, but this shift in the way people were starting to shop became a huge focus for Frida. I mean, I thought that Gucci was, Gucci image was all about sex, glamour and rock and roll. And you're showing us the pie chart. Tell us why. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, since I don't spend most of my time uh, at gathering numbers because I'm, I'm doing another job, but uh, actually I was uh, really, really surprised when my marketing team showed me these figures because I couldn't imagine that uh, teenagers in their early 20s, they spend more than 47% of their time on internet and only 3% on reading newspaper and magazine. So based on that we seated around the table, uh, me and my team and the people in the company and we understood that uh, we needed to open more than possible uh, to this future generation, to this next generation, uh, uh, a new world, a new way to communicate uh, and to build a platform with them. And so uh, I think because they are the, in a way the future of the, uh, the, sorry, the customers of the future and so I think it's very important to create an interaction with them. I know that you've got another whole vein to your work, not just e-commerce, but the whole social media side of what you do. Um, so tell us about Facebook and about being on there as Gucci. Well, uh, Facebook, uh, we discovered uh, um, a few times ago that uh, uh, we had an unofficial page uh, of Gucci on Facebook uh, that has already more than 40,000 fans. So at that point we decided to open a, an official page on that and now we have half a million fans that's following us. And I think what is interesting here is that uh, you cannot find only videos or photos or fashion shows uh, or products, but uh, we, we tried to create uh, a great interaction with people and, uh, and users of Facebook with our friends because uh, we can uh, offer all, every kind of content uh, regarding, for example, every kind of initiative of the company or, I don't know, celebrity that is wearing uh, a new project for UNICEF uh, or the... Who are you with there? I'm with Michael Roberts. Oh, yes, launching his book. Yes, launching the new book, which is the new, uh, the new holiday campaign to benefit, to benefit UNICEF in the next holiday campaign. And then, uh, of course, other many contents. And I think it's very interesting to see how people is interacting with us and how this new generation is becoming very loyal with us. So uh, I think it's, that, that's really exciting and really intriguing. As her attention became further drawn into the online world, focused on building Gucci's presence on the growing social media platforms, the clothes suffered and fashion journalists were quick to note. Mm -hmm. 
Looking at the Gucci campaigns from Vrida's era, luxury jet set was the prevailing theme. Mert and Marcus were the hot photographers of the moment, shooting most of the campaigns for Gucci, but also for several other of the Italian brands, making their proposition on trend, but not trend setting. The campaigns were beautiful, but almost indistinguishable from the other Italian houses. This era for Gucci was also a bit peculiar when it came to their celebrity ambassadors, a relationship that should feel more intrinsic and genuine rather than an actor playing a role for a paycheck. Coming off the heels of Gossip Girl, Blake Lively was fully embraced by Anna Wintour and courted by every designer, but her association with Gucci was weakened by her famously close relationship with Karl Lagerfeld, starring in Chanel campaigns at the same time as for Gucci. Having a celebrity ambassador that seems happier wearing another designer's clothes does not help fortify the identity of the brand. In regards to James Franco, he physically fit the part of the Gucci man as seen by Frida Giannini, but it was clear to see from his interviews that his own personality was far from the suave, fashionable jet setter that Gucci were trying to sell. Chris Evans and Evan Rachel Wood also landed a few Gucci fragrance campaigns together, despite having no prior relationship and actually meeting on set of the Gucci Guilty campaign. Perhaps the most puzzling of the celebrity relationships was that with Jennifer Lopez for Gucci's children's campaign. One of the most famous fashion moments in red carpet history was in the year 2000, when Jennifer Lopez wore a green Versace dress to the Grammy Awards, so bringing her into the world of Gucci seemed forced and disingenuous. By around 2012, Gucci's sales started to slump, then decrease, while the other brands under caring, like Yves Saint Laurent and Bottega Veneta, were experiencing double-digit percentage growth. In December 2014, the departure of Gucci CEO Patrizio Di Marco and Frida Giannini was announced, with Frida due to leave in February 2015 after her final women's wear collection. But in a messy turn of events, she was abruptly fired and kicked out of the building on January 9th, merely days before the men's wear show on January 19th. Despite whispers of big names like Riccardo Tisci or Kim Jones replacing Giannini, Gucci looked in-house and selected accessories designer Alessandro Michele to step in. Rather than sending out Giannini's last menswear collection that was essentially ready to go, Michele whipped together a collection of his own vision that shocked the audience. A far cry from the rigid masculinity of Giannini's menswear, Michele's first collection debuted a new Gucci man, a softer silhouette on a more androgynous model. The women's wear collection that came out the following month had more time to execute, and building upon what we saw in the menswear, the new direction for Gucci had officially arrived. This geek chic aesthetic with blurred gender lines strongly influenced many designers' collections the following seasons, but the new vision for Gucci was solidified in the work of Glenn Lutchford. He executed and elevated Michele's dream for Gucci, zigging while the rest of the industry was zagging, fully delving into a maximalist throwback aesthetic while everyone else was pushing streetwear and athleisure. I've just noticed in the last couple of seasons that the designers are coming with a completely different attitude. Like Gucci, for example, like Alessandro just took over. And it was so exciting being on set with him because he's completely free, you know what I mean? He's not thinking in a similar way to his predecessors and what's coming next. They sent me a couple of reference pictures and I thought, prior to the job, and I thought, oh, that's really great. But I bet when we get to the set, we won't actually be allowed to do that. But then when we got to the set, we actually could do that. And he was really encouraging just to keep going and keep going, which was so exciting, you know. People are just starting to take a few more risks and stuff like that. I think what they realize is looking at a magazine where every picture looks the same is not a good idea. So I don't know who sparked that idea. I guess Alessandro was definitely one of them, but the idea that you can actually take a company and just turn it completely upside down and try something new and it still works. It was a bit of an eye-opener. It was like, oh, you can actually do this. Michele and Lutchford created this new world of Gucci, so regardless of who the photographer or director was for subsequent projects, it was clearly part of the same dialogue. Each campaign was full of fantasy and narrative, so when customers were buying a handbag or a scarf, it was their ticket of admission to an alternate reality. Michele's world was colorful, expressive, sensitive, luxurious, carefree, but above all, it was joyful. So much of today's fashion is selling a cold vision of wealth based on exclusivity and conformity to a certain unattainable standard. But Michele's Gucci embraced the freaks and geeks. 
I love to be open to the things that are, make me feel like, oh my gosh, what is this? And I start to play with these kind of things. I like the ugly things. We are selling the dream of freedom. It's like a voice that is saying, uh, if you are like this, you are good, nothing wrong. Celebrities were once again clamoring to wear Gucci like during the Tom Ford era. And unlike the ambassadors under Frida Giannini, you could see the authenticity in these relationships and how perfectly this era of Gucci coincided with the personal style of these artists. Jared Leto has been wearing Gucci since the beginning of Alessandro's tenure, with Leto seemingly morphing into Michele as the years have gone by. For Harry Styles as well, his transition into solo stardom coincided with his full embrace of Gucci, starring in multiple campaigns and culminating in a collaboration with the brand for the Ha 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 collection. Dakota Johnson, Florence Welch, and Jody Turner-Smith also dazzled in Gucci, from red carpets to campaigns. Who's your customer? Is it the movie star, or is it the 19-year-old with their nose pressed against the glass at Gucci that you're hoping I don't wears know. what you put your heart into? I don't know. I into? was thinking about everybody, because fashion is really for everybody. But doesn't everybody have to afford it? I don't know. Yeah, maybe no. Another unique part of Alessandro Michele's tenure at Gucci was the collaborations with other designers. Only with a brand identity as strong as Gucci could you get away with these mashups, which included Balenciaga, Adidas, Palace, North Face, and Disney. Michele's departure from Gucci came as a surprise to many in the fashion industry, given he was riding hot off the heels of the Buzzy Twinsburg collection and Billie Eilish's red carpet debut with her new boyfriend in Head to Toe Gucci. Despite being one of the most beloved contemporary fashion designers, who brought carrying billions of euros in increased revenue, that was not enough to keep the conglomerate happy. Even though third quarter sales in 2022 increased by 9%, it was below Kering's overall growth of 14% and the 11% growth they forecasted for Gucci. The cruel reality of today's luxury fashion industry is the expectation of exponential growth, as unrealistic and unsustainable as it may be. Gucci has yet to announce Michele's successor, and it is hard to guess whether they will go the route of bringing in one of the star designers currently unseated in fashion's musical chairs, or try to recreate the magic of an unknown designer like Michele. Whoever takes over for the next era of Gucci, we can expect a high-pressure environment with the eyes of the entire fashion industry watching.